Hey guys, in case you missed last week's episode, here's a recap of what you missed. Last time, the unsung heroes of the body shop began the restoration on one of the most requested renovations ever, a 1971 Dodge Demon. This time, Mark and Doug fire up the engine for the Turbine Bronze 1968 Charger, while Dave preps the firewall for its drivetrain installation. Let me get the OI ball on here. They're coming to get you, Barbara. It has been established that the unburied dead are coming back to life. threat this station will remain on the air day and night Woo! l parking break so a lot going on right now of course like there always is at graveyard cars uh lots of cars lots of parts lots of pieces probably two dozen projects right in the middle of all of them so we're going to hit as much as we can this week one of the things i've got dave doing is some of the under dash plumbing in preparation for the dash assembly on our 1968 charger one of the first things he's putting in is the parking brake assembly that goes on the left hand kick panel or, or a pillar area what's cool about this little 68 charger it's an mm1 car or just m would be the paint code if you actually look in the book and that stands for turbine bronze metallic it's beautiful and frankly we don't have another one of those cars in that color here in anything no no 68 no anything that's mm1 except for that car right Right there so that is and that's the first one wheels ever painted as well all right right now dave is installing the emergency brake or park brake system in our 1968 dodge charger i don't want to stop him and make him show all this stuff in real time over there so what we've done is simulated the exact same parking brake system over here so you can see how it works when it's actually in the car to help me i have my trusted understudy cousin dougie yeah yeah He's gonna help me show you how this works. So let's take a look at the actual mechanism itself. That's what Dave's putting in right now. So if this unit were actually mounted in your car right now, all you would see is from here down. That's what would show from underneath the dash is this lever, which is why it's painted black, by the way. You would sit down in your car, your big, beautiful Dodge Charger, you'd stomp this pedal down, and that would engage the parking brake system. So let's talk about what all is moving when I do that. We'll reset it. Number one, you'll listen as I go through that cycle. And it gets harder and harder. That's because it's bringing the tension of the shoes out, which we'll show you in a minute how that works. Once you have that pedal down where it's got a lot of tension against it, that car's not going anywhere. You could put it in neutral and you're not gonna move that car if everything's working like it's supposed to. When you wanna take off, this is your brake release. You just pull it. That releases the pedal, it comes back up, you're taken off. So that's the pedal that you see. And the only other function that you have right here is this little tab, this little bullet. It goes onto a tab that is designed to ground, okay? This normally has a wire that goes up underneath the dash and a light will pop on. That light will say parking or brake. The way that's engaged is when I push this pedal away, you see it touches, then it's back. Every time that pedal's down, the light's on. Every time the pedal's up, the light goes out. And so what we're doing here is we're transferring the energy from this lever back to our back brake shoes. And we're doing it with this cable right here. In this particular case, I've got this set up like an A body. So it's got this main cable. This cable goes in through the mechanism into a small clevis pin right there. And that clevis pin holds that brake cable in place to the mechanism itself. So when I cycle it, you see the tension on that cable coming up. Okay, so this right here is the right-hand rear parking brake cable. This is the left hand. If they were in the car, they would actually be located in a little bit different spot. But I put them here just so you could see how it works. This rod is an adjustable rod that goes onto this uh, coupler right here. The other end of that cable, as you watch it, would go underneath the car and up into the driver's compartment. That's what Dougie is. Say hi, Dougie, you're the driver's compartment. Hello. Boy. 
Anyway, <laughs> what's going to happen is he's going to cycle that emergency brake or, or parking brake pedal. And when he does, these are going to expand out and go back, expand out and go back. So Doug, go ahead and cycle through it. A little more so we can see the action. So what you see is those things going in and out like that. These right here are gonna press against a brake drum. So let me show you how that thing works. This would be the brake drum. This shoe right here would be pressing against this section of the drum right here. This shoe would press against here, okay? So with that, I take, put our brake drum back on. So what I do here is you see that I'm moving it back and forth. As I move it back and forth, it shows. <laughs> what? I'm it sorry. shows that it's free like that, okay? Right. Now, when I tell Dougie that I do want him to go ahead and press it down, <laughs> which is different than right there when I was just. <laughs> Can you let off? Sorry. It's okay. You see how I can't move it anymore? You need a psychiatrist, man. Something's wrong with you. Yep, I'm sorry. So basically that is how the parking brake or emergency brake system works in a vehicle. Now, the only recommendation I would have for those of you at home is not have Dougie be your assistant anytime you're doing the tutorial. <laughs> Out there, so parking brake in. So I'm gonna get on out of here. Okay, all right, let's get out of here. With some of the components able to go into the 68 Charger now, uh, I wanna move forward. We've got the engine and the transmission done. They've been on a jig now for a little bit. We wanna move them outside. We've got a brand new engine run stand, which actually really isn't an engine run stand, but an engine run assembly that's gonna work with our stand. So I'm excited to get going on that. We should be able to fire it up, go through all the fluid levels, get that system ready to go into the car. Okay, have you primed the carburetor yet? No, sir. Okay, why don't we put some fuel in the carburetor? before we start cranking it over. Doug and I are out getting ready to fire up the 1968 440 Magnum. This is the numbers matching engine for our 68 Charger RT, the MM1 Turbine Bronze Metallic, I believe. Uh -huh. White Bumblebee? Yeah. I haven't put Bumblebee on yet, but I will and it'll be beautiful. This is the original numbers transmission, numbers engine. We're gonna fire it up on our new Easy Run stand. I'll show you a little bit about that as we get started, but right now we're gonna get the engine running. What do you think? Uh -huh. Will it run? What you, you're gambling, man. Will she fire right off? It's what we do every day. It's gonna run. Why are you staring at me? <laughs> It'll run. Oh, sorry. Now, the fun side of working with my cousin Doug is I love him. I mean, I've said it before, we know each other our whole lives. He's a very methodical mechanic, much like myself. He's a great diagnostician. He doesn't jump to any conclusions. He's a good tech, a really good tech but I always am a, a bit bewildered by some of his behavior. That's what I mean by, I, I think maybe there's like a delayed reaction, right? Maybe like if it comes out of my mouth and it hits his ears and most people would take like a nanosecond, I think he takes like a nano minute. So he kind of looks at you confused and that always throws me off because I don't know if he's looking at me confused because he disagrees with what I said or if he just doesn't understand what I said. But at the end of the day, while I do love giving him crap and I do think he's, by the way, from another planet, I did figure that out. Um, he's a good hearted guy and I do love working with him. It's great to have him back here. Watch your fingers. I put a lot, this ain't no 318. It's a 440 Magnum. Yeah, I usually dump a couple gallons in there. Nitro? Okay. That's what that is. We got fuel in there. Let's turn our ignition on there, cousin Doug. Contact. So we have, yep. So we got our ignition in the on yes. position. We Look got gauges, good. Uh-huh. Want you to turn your coil power on. We don't need the fuel pump because we're using the original mechanical fuel pump. So what's cool about this system that we had built, we can roll it right up to one of our engines on our engine stand and pretend it's in the car. We can top off every fluid level. If it runs and works good out here and with no leaks, no problems, it'll do the same thing in the car. On our 68 Charger, the turbine bronze metallic car, 
Not everything has showed up yet for the order. We're still putting in big orders. These cars take thousands of parts. And so not everything is here, but there is enough stuff here that we can get the firewall built out in the, in, from the standpoint of like the difficult to install after the engine is in type of parts. Our brake booster, portioning valve, the, the front line that goes across the firewall, windshield warp motor. Because other things like the windshield washer reservoir and the horns, we can put those on any time after they come in. So I've got Dave Bolton those pieces in, so when we are done, we can mount that transmission and engine in the car, be a roller. Here's our brake booster master cylinder assembly. We're gonna put in our 68 Dodge Charger here. So you can see I got everything built out on it. All right, so we're gonna feed that right through there. Line up my holes. That top one goes on there, just like that. So Cousin Dougie and I right now are doing the final plumb out on this new run stand that we're connecting to our uh, existing engine stand. A lot of little connections. You've got your your cooling lines, right? You got upper and lower radiator hose. You have to make sure that your fluids are topped off with this unit. We're able to do that, making sure all those things are ready. So just like final stuff, just like you would if you were putting it in a car, we're making those connections so that we can start it up, hopefully start it up, get it broke in, get that cam broke in, get the paint burned off of it, and it'll really be ready to go into the car. And we'll know 100% that we're not gonna have problems. So. We have coil, we have that. Let's start by just hitting the starter button and seeing what explodes. Go. Stand back. I'm back. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Stay tuned. Dave educates us on the Bengal Chargers. Mark opens the Dave Weiss books to teach us about date-coded K-members. And the ghouls install an original front clip in pristine condition to a 1969 Plymouth Cuda. The 1968 Dodge Charger behind me is a beautiful car, painted MM1 bronze. You might be tempted to assume it's an orange paint job if you were to see it out of the corner of your eye. In fact, in 1968, there was no orange paint available on the 68 Charger. But I hear you saying, Dave, I've seen pictures on the internet of a 68 Charger painted orange. First of all, people do repaints all the time, so don't be silly. Second, what you're probably looking at is a very rare charger with a special option paint, commonly referred to as the Bengal Charger. When the Cincinnati Bengals, yes, the football team, was first created in 1967, they were added to the roster of teams for the American Football League. Local Dodge dealer Tom Neer was a devoted fan of the AFL and was excited to have an expansion in his hometown, so he ordered some Dodge Chargers for his dealership to commemorate the new team. Tom didn't want just any old Charger, though. He wanted something that would sell, so he asked Dodge if he could get the cars in orange and black, which would be the colors of the Bengals' uniforms. Well, as I already said, Dodge wasn't offering any orange that year, so they said he can get the color if he ordered at least 50. Tom did, and Dodge put together 50 chargers with the 999 paint code for special order paint. The cars were painted Omaha orange. They also had special badges made that were added to both front fenders that read Bengal Charger, as well as the bumblebee stripe on the back, black final top, Incidentally, Omaha Orange would later become K2 for vitamin C orange. Of the 50 that were made in 1968, only a few were known to have survived. So when you see a 68 Charger and it looks orange, chances are it's either an MM1 bronze or a repaint, or you might just be looking at one of the rarest and often forgotten special order Chargers ever made. Just about a half a turn on that critter. Thank you. All right, let's start this mother biscuit up. So Cousin Dougie and I are in the middle of making all the connections on our 68 Charger RT, numbers matching 440, doing the things that we need to do to be able to fire it up. Hopefully, that's exactly what it does. It fires up, runs good, cam breaks in, and we're golden. Crank her up. There's not a better feeling. You hit that button and it fires off and doesn't backfire and crap all over the place. Now, I always expect them to be noisy because the lifters aren't pumped up yet. But boy, it sounds great. We're gonna run it until the thermostat opens and then we're gonna add more water to make sure 
Our cooling system is working okay. It's idling fast right now, about 2,400, 2,500 RPM. That's because we're trying to break in the cam. But here's what's cool about this. Come here, I'll show you. Right now, our power steering unit's working. On our other unit, we couldn't do that. Now we can run our power steering. See the paint starting to burn off the manifolds? We have our transmission back here. We can go ahead and put that in neutral, pop it off, and it's ready to go in the car. Go ahead and shut it down. Kill it. Here's our brake booster master cylinder assembly we're gonna put her in. So then what I'm gonna grab next is my lines. I'm gonna put a nut up on that there. I'm gonna go ahead and grab my lines because I do like to leave this a little bit loose. It makes it easier to line up your actual brake lines. But I'm gonna put this under here for now. I'm gonna feed these. These are really tight. A little bit here. You wanna get that as straight as you can. So when you get these in there, it's got, got that play in there. I wanna make sure I could tighten this up by hand. So now I'm feeling that. It goes in all the way down by hand. Just like that, okay? Got our other one here. We're gonna get this one up in here like this. You can see how tight that line is. Just wanna make sure nothing's rubbing together and I'm gonna move this spring up just to give that line a little more protection. That's what those springs are for, is something rubs on it doesn't rub through your actual brake line and cause a leak. So anywhere there's a bend, it's gonna be on there or anything, something crosses the other one, it's gonna be on there. So there's that. So now I'll grab my wiper motor. My wiper motor will go right there. So let's grab that dude. Okay, so right now I'm just gonna have Doug check the water, go get a rag in case it pukes on you. That's what happened to Royal. Did you ever see that? Uh-uh. I said, don't take that off of there. I'm Royal Yoakum. I changed locks for the school district. <laughs> Bam. Shot right to the ceiling. Absolutely. So be careful. So when you start one of these engines up, whether it's on an engine run stand or whether it's in the car, there's a purging process. You top off the radiator as far as you can go. Usually it's about a gallon to a gallon and a half of water antifreeze mix. But the thermostat isn't open at that time. So the whole block is empty. It doesn't have water in it. What you have to do, and this is where you have to be careful, is you run that engine up until you believe that the thermostat has opened. You feel that upper radiator hose. As soon as that thing gets hot, you know the thermostat's open. You also know it just sucked a gallon right out of the radiator and put it into the engine. That means the radiator is low now. So if you've been watching Graveyard Cars for any period of time, you know we run a lot of our engines, try to get them all, on this engine run stand, the easy run engine run stand. What we loved about that was that you could take an engine, move it over to the stand, make your connections, run it, make sure that you don't have oil leaks, make sure that it doesn't overheat, make sure that the carburetor's dialed in right, all these little things. And so it's much easier if it's kind of a failure to do it on that stand than if it were in the car. Okay, so right now, we've got great oil pressure. The engine's running really good. It's running about 2,500 RPM. I'm gonna back the idle down. The cam is broke in. Then we'll shut it off. That's a good idle right there for right now. It's a little high, but that's okay. If all goes well now, we don't have any problems from here. Everything seems to be fine on the drivetrain. We'll get it moved over. Dave should be ready for us, and we can start putting that together. Good job, we're safe. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> kill the mill. We call it kill the mill. You gotta have cool terms when you're talking about engines, right? Three-speed wiper motor. Beautifully restored, look at that. I mean. Yeah, it's just beautiful. It's got a different style of case on it. We're gonna throw this baby in there and do my wiring. There's my wiring harness and that'll go into that bulkhead. Slide it on there. You always wanna make sure you got your gasket on there. If you don't have this foam gasket on right here, when water goes in there, it's gonna go right into your floorboard. So make sure you put a new gasket on there and then make sure you got these little sleeves in here too. That keeps that rubber from crushing. You need that little bushing in there. Most of the time when you pull your wiper motor off, all those old bushings fall on the ground and you lose them, so. And as I tighten these down, it'll strip off the paint, just like it did back in the day. 
If you have a 1970 Dodge Challenger with uh, option code C62, it means you have an adjustable driver's front seat. Besides forward and backwards, what other ways does the seat move? Does it move up and down? Does it tilt forward, tilt backwards, or does it do all of the above? Check out the answer after the break. So do you think you know the answer about the adjustable driver's seat? If you answered all the above, you're correct. This particular model of seat was a six-way adjustable seat, so it adjusted front, back, tilted forward, tilted back, and went up and down. Super cool option in 1970. On our 1969 Cuda, now remember this was our 383 four-speed A57 car from I think last season we introduced it. Blue on blue car, very rare, they made 23 of them. We're up to a point where we're ready to install the used front clip. So I'm gonna take a few minutes and I wanna talk about what that means, why we decided to do a used clip, and some of the steps that have to happen in order to get that done. The clip behind me right now is the one that's going on the car. They've already took some time the other day and cleaned all the old parts, what they call the cut and trim. Get everything off of it that's garbage, it's not gonna be reused, is off of there. This is now 100% prepped and ready to go on the car. The car, George just came and asked if he could get it blown apart, I gave him the green light. And that's what they're getting ready to do. They'll do the same cutting and the same trimming, but in reverse on the body so that it can take this front clip. Gasket, make sure it's fresh. And there you have it. Okay, George and Adam have the 69 Cuda completely cut apart now. So that means they've got all the old pieces and parts off of the car everywhere that the new donor clip is going to intersect with. So what I've got out here right now is the torsion bar cross member that is off of our donor clip. So that clip up there once had this unit built into it and we've had to dissect it out. And the main reason for dissecting it out is the way we want to put that front clip onto the car, we couldn't have done it with this piece fastened into place because it has to go up, over and down and marry into the rocker. So we dissected this piece off. Now, originally we were going to leave the original torsion bar cross member in place, but we chose not to because when we got a little closer look at it, at a glance it looked like it was pretty solid, but internally it had rust issues. So if you look down in here especially, you can see the deterioration way down in there. If it's rusty, if it's bad, if you're seeing signs of that or excessive pitting, it's also thin in other areas. The, the integrity of the metal has been compromised. Let's take a look at the inner fender and frame rail. Now this is the one that came off of the 69 Cuda originally here on the right hand side and that one is the one for the left hand side. This cut out area here once went all the way over to here. Okay, that would have been the end of the inner fender. Now this cutting here that you see is brand new. See how it's turned white? That's because that's where the body man just to get it out of the way so he could drill up to the firewall, he went ahead and used a torch. But you look here, this is an older cut. The reason for that cutout is if you had a big block in an A body and you wanted headers, the only way they had them back then was fender well exit headers. So they, somebody took a torch, cut out this inner fender well, and then bolted the headers on, and they would have came out through here, just behind the right front tire, got straight down to the ground, and then tipped back into a collector and you would have ran exhaust. They still make them today, but it's a shame that they had to destroy the inner fender to do it. Now here we are 40 some years later, it wasn't just that, but if you look at the decay, this is the inner part of the shock tower, very rigid piece of steel. This window that you see shouldn't even be here. That's where it's rusted completely away. Same thing up here. These areas where you can actually see the shock tower means the apron panel or the inner fender is completely gone from it. Same thing here, you got a hole. You can actually stick your hand up through that hole. You shouldn't be able to do that. So that meant that the inner fender was bad. We've got the exact same thing if you look at this one going on over here. Now, the other piece that it's married to right now is the frame rail itself. So let's take a look at that. This is the inner piece that makes up the frame rail and the outer piece, it's stacked metal. When metal rusts, it swells. If you look, you'll see it almost looks like 
layers of other metal, that's rust and decay. When that piece and that piece are swollen the way that those are, that means that there's rust in there. If you go down to this section here, you'll see that this inner piece and this outer piece are nice and flush together all the way up through here. Really nice. But as it goes further forward, water got in there and it started to swell. And the more it swelled, the more damage it did. So that's why we decided that we would do aprons and rails on the car. Okay, now that we have the engine running good, I have to get it all cleaned up and put on the installation card to take over to Dave's area for installation. Stay tuned. Mark resumes the walkthrough of the front clip donation for the 1969 Plymouth Cuda. And Dave continues plumbing out the 1968 Chargers firewall in preparation for its drivetrain installation. This again is our inner fender. This is our frame rail that we were just pointing to back here on the car. These are other pieces that make up part of that front uh, inner structure area. Most of these pieces you can get from AMD. You can buy them one at a time and you can put them in the car one at a time. The owner of the car is a Mopar aficionado. He wanted us to make every effort to use original Mopar parts on the car that we could do. So the car is one of 23, 383 four-speed 69 Cuda. It's a very rare car, it's a valuable car. He provided us with this front clip. He had found one that had the exact same radiator opening, the exact same measurements, the exact same parts as what was on his car, except beautiful, not rusty. The big hole that we had on our other panel from the fender well exit header, obviously that's gone. You look at our metals, the frame rail metals, there's no swelling in between them. There's no damage from rust. The other advantage to putting a unit on like this is all your original spot welds that we work so hard to duplicate. We don't have to work hard at it because they're already there. So what we're doing is we're gonna put a front clip interstructure on that car so that it's undetectable as to whether or not it had a clip put on it. That's our goal. So far. Dave has begun the firewall plumbing and the beautiful 1968 turbine bronze charger, while Mark and his cousin Dougie started its fully restored engine for the first time. Now, Mark continues to walk us through the front clip that's going to be grafted to a valuable 1969 Plymouth Cuda, currently in bodywork stage. The transmission cross member that you see here, this again is our original one that came off of this that's in really nice shape. But you can see the extent. One, the floor pan once went down on here. So once all these pieces go back in, we still gotta put a floor in the car. It'll go down over the top of this. Originally, this came in here like this, went like that, and got all welded together. The ends intersect with the inner rockers. So what's gonna happen is, once they get the front clip on the car, they're gonna come in and drop this down into place over the top. So this will get lifted up. A Couple of guys will bring it in here and they're gonna line up. This area right here is gonna come over here and it's gonna weld on right here where you see the copper weld through primer. Notice the same shape. Then they're gonna backfill those welds they're gonna tie it in at the floor, tie it into the torsion bar cross member. That's not only the thinking behind why we chose a use clip, but some of the steps that it takes to be able to install that. Um, I'm gonna let George and Adam go ahead and start moving forward on this. They'll get it mocked into place. Once it's mocked up, I'll come out and sign it off and they can start welding. So in the case of our used clip or our Calcut nose, Everything is in and where it's supposed to be and made it up like it's supposed to. It's, it's really nice when it's available. One of the hardest things in the world is going out right now and saying, hey, I want that same clip you just put on that 69 Barracuda. I'd like to find one for my 70. Yeah, good luck. 69 Barracuda, granny car with a really nice little clip on it's gonna be a lot easier to find than one that would have went in the 70 Cuda. 
So that's why AMD is around. I just got done putting some components in our 68 Dodge Chargers firewall. I didn't have all the components I normally would put on the car, but I had enough to actually get by so we can put the engine, drivetrain, and front suspension in. Push that clip in a little bit more to hold that brake line in there. Same with that one. Same with that one. So having those in, along with the brake booster, master cylinder, proportioning valves, and those side you know, brake lines going down the frame rail makes it a lot easier. So I have enough components in there, so we're ready to get this engine suspension put in. So there we go. That's all she wrote. True or false? In 1970, the Dodge Challenger TA was the only model available with a unique fiberglass hood with a snorkel style scoop. Think you know the answer? Check it out after the break. Think you know the answer? The answer is false. In 1970, some Hemi Dodge Challengers actually had that TA style hood due to a shortage of shaker style hoods that would have came standard on a 1970 Dodge Hemi Challenger. So now you know. Hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Getting Wise with my friend Dave Weiss who writes these really cool books. What I've turned to in the page here is the date code on the K-member. Now the K-member, just at a glance, is this big bad boy right here. This is the subframe or K-member that the engine and all the suspension bolts to. What a lot of people don't realize is there's a date code on there. Now this is a regular wedge K-member, so it's like 383, 440 type K-member. You see this little square box here, it's got a 3449 and a one over here. This code means it's the 344th day of 1969 and it was built on the first shift. This particular car was scheduled to be built October 9th, 1969, which is the 282nd day of that year. So if we come down and we take a look, here's the stampings. You can see they're, they're actually hand stamped into the steel the 252nd day of 1969, as well as the first shift, like our reference manual has. We know the car was built on the 282nd day of 1969, so this is 30 days ahead. This thing was built a month before the car. That's a perfect date code for that. Okay, so the next thing we wanna take a look at here that I've got marked is in our electrical appearance section, talking about the 426 Hemi spark plug wires. The wires that I have on here are replicas of the originals. They have the right date code on them, but there are subtle differences between the reproductions, which are very, very nice, and the original ones. If we look here, it says original 426 six Hemi spark plug wires have a distinct mold parting line on top of the boot on the valve cover. In addition, the entire boot on the spark plug is very sharp in many details. The aftermarket boots have a softer details around the boot. Let's talk about this division line, this parting line. If we look right here, you can see they're highlighting and blown it up over here, this sharp ridge where these two are joined together. Here's an example on the aftermarket version, there is still a seam or a line there, but it's very soft. If we look at ours, we'll see what they're talking about. This is a very soft little edge right here compared to that rigid one they talked about in the book itself. So again, if you're at a car show and you're judging something for OE 100%, these spark plug wires might not make that call. But to buy a set of NOS spark plug wires, you could spend, I would imagine, thousands of dollars on that. So these work just fine in that situation. So there you have it. That is called Getting Wise with our friend Dave Weiss at mmcdetroit.com. How I roll. Now with the CUDA done, um, George can go on to the back half of it. Doug has the engine and the transmission drivetrain disconnected from the easy run, so it's ready to come over here. Uh, I want to work with Doug one-on-one, -on -one. so I'm just gonna grab him. We haven't worked together, just putting an engine and transmission in, probably in 35 years, so I thought that might be kind of fun. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, so we're gonna install the rear end first. Doug. I think the car will need to come down. So these four studs right here go through these four holes right here in the leaf spring hanger, the reinforcement, all the way in, and then they get bolted down. At that point, we raise the back up, hang the shackles into place where they're supposed to go, and then we can let it down, connect the shocks and the rest of the lines. Got it. Okay. Here. 
I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't say I was having fun. You know, we, we did so much of this together as kids that now that we're grown up, it's pretty much just one, two, three. It's actually kind of fun working with somebody that, in a way, thinks of the next step ahead just like you do. So it's just almost like you're putting one foot in front of the other and just walking. How's yours doing, Mark? I got one, but we're, we got an angle thing going on. So do you have yours already started? I do. There, got it. Got it? OK. Beautiful. Okay, you got your shackle hardware. Nice. Yes. There we go. Put the nuts on it. Okay. So right now we have the front uh, kept nuts in place at the very front of the leaf spring hanger, and then we have the shackle bolt started. Is that true? Yes. So I'm safe to raise it up so we can work on it. Okay. Let's tighten down all of our bolts. Go ahead and let me know when you're up far enough for that to go on. There it is. Okay. Okay, so right now we've got the rear end is in place. We have the shackles, the leaf spring hangers, the shocks, all the basic things. So we can move to the front. Let's get the front end installed, all the K-member suspension. Then we'll go get all the necessary tools so we can put the clips, the retainers, the emergency brake cables on and all that. So right now we just want to get the main big bulk parts in. So let's move to the front. With the rear axle assembly in place, all that weight, that gives us the counterbalance that we needed to make sure that that car couldn't tip forward. So with that, we're gonna move forward, lower the car down, start lining it up with the K-member and see if we can marry those together. So Doug and I got the rear end installed in the charger. We're getting ready to move the front suspension, K-member engine transmission in now. Uh, once we do that, we'll bolt the main things in, the transmission cross member, K-member bolts. Then we can raise the car back up, round up all the necessary tools to go back to the rear end and hook up all of the cables, all the brake lines, all the things that need to be done, that finish step. We'll do the same at the front. When that happens, I can put a bumblebee on the back. Nice. Can you do a look? You... A squeaky guy? No, it's not squeaky. What the hell is that? Oh. Can we just put the engine in now? Yeah, yeah. It's got to ruin everything with some weird Glenwood thing. We're trained professionals here. Watch your head. I am. In 1968, these engines were turquoise, all right? In 69, the HP engines, they went to the Hemi Orange, the street Hemi Orange that you mostly see us work on around here. But have no illusion, this is an actual turquoise engine. It's correct Chrysler color, but sometimes people say, well, it's blue. And there's no mistaking corporate blue with this turquoise. I happen to like the turquoise look. I think it's a, I think it's a unique, I think it's a richer look. I think that the Hemi Orange is a bit racier, but I think kind of fitting a car like a 68 Charger, I like the color of the engine. <laughs> How are we looking? Looking good? Easy. Needs to go back about two inches towards the rear, but side to side is pretty good. Okay, so just straight back a little straight bit. Back. Okay. Okay, real slow, we go down here. And good? Yeah. It's a little easier than the old tree out back, huh? A little bit. The whole thing was, when you're talking about pulling engines out when we were kids, you didn't have all this stuff. I mean, and I've got pictures of guys that send them in all the times so when I talk about that. They'll send in pictures of them standing there in their stupid ACDC t-shirt or Led Zeppelin t-shirt and crazy hair down to here. They're 16, 18 years old, lifting an engine and transmission out by an old tree in the backyard. Okay, it feels pretty good so far. Okay, Car down. let's see if we can get the uh, back ones in. Beautiful, you love it when that happens. Yes. It doesn't happen all the nope. time. <laughs> That's great. Yep. Beautiful, okay. Lucky. Right now we have the K-member bolts in place. Doug's underneath there putting the transmission cross member bolts in. I'm gonna give him a hand with that. Once we get those in, we can raise the car up and then button everything up. And there's a lot of pieces that need to go together after that, so. Cousin Dougie! Can I put that bolt in? I really wanna put that bolt in. You had all the fun. I wanna do it. Do that. 
Okay, put that on that. And next one. This back one here. You want a hammer? There you go. Just put the nut on there. You don't need to worry about tightening them. We'll raise it up. Okay. Go ahead and move that light out of there, Doug. Set it down so it doesn't look like we're shooting a TV show. I think with Doug, like his elevator just isn't stopping on all the floors. And I love him, but I've noticed that the older we get and the more floors there are, the less stops it makes. You know, move the light. Like a caveman that probably just picks up a wheel. I could use this. Put it somewhere. What? Let's set it down over there, it'd be fine. Sure, sure. Right there is great, yeah. Okay. Now I won't kick it. Okay. So we can now tighten up our K-member bolts and then our transmission cross-member bolts. Good job. Okay. <clears throat> you saw Deliverance, right? Uh-huh. Oh, look at that. Okay, and the nut Pick and a lot of fun working with Doug, good memories. Everything went fine. The engine, the transmission, the rear end, everything went into place. Doug did a nice job of making sure everything was ready. That's kind of when I was in that area over there. I would think out every single component and get as much on that stand as possible. And he did the same thing. So yeah, when you're at the end, you raise the car up and here you got this beautiful engine transmission, the rear end, things are fastened together with the right fasteners. They fit the way they're supposed to fit. It's just, it's just really nice. And it was a lot of fun to be able to work with him. Okay, I'm letting this down. We're moving to the other side. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay. So Dougie and I have eight weeks into putting this K-member in, so that's good. All right. You want me to run it this time? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Here we go. Now, you see that shock? I'd like it to go through that hole up there as I raise this up. Look at that, it sure is. Oh, this one's Doug's eight feet tall, so he can see all that stuff. I can't see. It. So as soon as he gets that nut tightened down on the control arm, we'll take our little adjustment uh, jacks, standing jack out. Then we can raise up the torsion bars, preload them, finish hooking up the rest of the fasteners, the brake lines, things like that. And I'm in a position to do the bumblebee strike, which I'm looking forward to. So all in all, we had a great week. A lot of stuff got done. This is just the stuff we have time to show. I mean, just like if you take that emergency brake tutorial, that takes time to set that up and to show that. So, I mean, it'd have to be a 10 hour show to be able to show what we do in the course of a day. And even at that, it'd be the Reader's Digest version. But you gotta see that, a lot of fun. Things are going good at Graveyard Cars. See you guys next week. Sorry I have to do the wrap up all by myself. It's not my fault. The director actually made the mistake and forgot we had to do wrap up, so. Okay. No, I was talking about totally somebody else, not you. <laughs>